Hi, I'm Becky Peters. Thank you so much for joining me as I talk about my project, Predicting Youth Risk Behaviors, Modeling the Youth Risk Behavior Survey for Relevant Discussions with Our Youth. Today, we have a few topics for discussion. First, we'll cover some background and motivation for the project. We will explore and model the data that I used. We'll take a look at some predictions in the dashboard that I created, and we'll talk about some future work. For the first part with background and motivation, I want to start with a quote from Alfie Cohen, who's an educator I really admire. He said, kids learn to make good decisions by making decisions, not by following directions. And I think as a parent and as um, a doctor with their pediatric patients or a teacher or a counselor with their students, it's so important to partner with our youth to help them make decisions that might um, affect the rest of their lives. And youth deserve really accurate information about the consequences of those behaviors, as well as about the possibility of these choices arising in their lives. I'll use the analogy of jellyfish in the ocean, which is hence the picture, uh, to describe risky behaviors in one's youth. I think it's really important that as one navigates into adulthood that they know about all of these jellyfish that are there, but we can't throw them all at our youth at once. We need to know when's the right time to have these discussions with our young people so that they can um, make appropriate decisions and that we can have awesome, really good discussions with them about how it might impact their future. The CDC gives us a really great foundation for, uh, for these discussions with their youth, youth Risk Behavior Survey. You can find all of their information online. They've been running it since 1997. It's a biannual survey that they give in 35 districts around the country. And as you can see in the pictures on the right, they have a number of different reports and trends on how these things have changed over time on about 100 to 150 factors about being a young person in the state. So for any high school students or middle school students who's, um, what are their sexual behaviors like, what, how, what kind of violence are they exposed to, uh, alcohol and drug use and things of that nature. For this project, however, I really wanted to dig down a little bit further into, an into a more individualized basis using 10 years of aggregated data. And my question was, can we predict youth risk behaviors using that with supervised multi-label classification algorithms? The targets that I had for this specific project are three questions from the survey. The first, have you ever had sex? The second, have you felt sad or hopeless for two weeks in a row, which could be a good indicator for suicidal tendencies? And lastly, have you ever tried cigarettes? Uh, and I also wanted to see which negative behaviors are most connected and most related. So I made a graph network for that, which we'll look at on the dashboard in a little bit. Potential users for this may be healthcare providers, considering that the majority of pediatricians spend 13 to 16 minutes with their average patient. And if that just happens once a year, we need to make sure that those are relevant and timely discussions. For parents and youth, Colorado, for example, where I live is one of 26 states without a sex education program. So I can't imagine they have programs for um, discussing a number of these other potentially risky behaviors. And also for education agencies for implementing outreach programs, developing curriculum, or for individual counseling. The data set itself, uh, which I just pulled from the CDC website, was relatively uniform as far as the number of surveys taken per year. Um, this is for gender assigned at birth, males and females, uh, over the course of 2009 to 2019, how many survey respondents they got. The ages ranged from 12 to 18 years old for the data that I looked at, while the majority of the students were 15 and 16 years old. The race and ethnicity of the respondents was primarily Hispanic, Black, and white. And then as far as the distribution for the classification targets that I was looking at specifically, you can see the first purple bar on the left for the negative response and on the right for an affirmative response for the question, have you ever had sex? About 63% of the students re reported that they did not and 37% reported that they had. And you can see the percentages for the other two targets there. Now, as far as metrics for our models, uh, the baseline accuracy would be the same as the percentages listed right above there in the no comments. So if we just assumed that everybody had never had sex or had never felt hopeless for two weeks in a row, we could get an accuracy from our model of 63 or 70% respectively. Our baseline precision, however, which is a measurement of our positive predictive value and tells us how many of the affirmative answers we're capturing would be zero because we wouldn't have any of those in our data. So as far as the algorithms, I used a library called Scikit MultiLearn, and I trained and compared a number of different algorithms to see which would give the best metrics on the ones that we just discussed on the last slide. A random forest algorithm was the best as far as our metrics went. Uh, you can see here the precision, which I mentioned is the positive predictive value or how many um, affirmative answers we were able to capture correctly. We got through the model 81%, 84%, and 82% for each of those questions. Um, so we were able to capture, for example, 84% of the students who said, who reported that they felt sad or hopeless for more than two weeks in a row, which is encouraging. 
The accuracy and Hamming loss were two other metrics that I used to compare these algorithms, both of which just report on the fraction of labels that were incorrectly predicted. And the accuracy for each of these three questions in isolation was in the 80s, 80 percent. And then the Hamming loss was just 0.14, which is basically an average of the incorrect um, responses for each of the three classifications. Now we will move over to the dashboard and take a look at a couple of predictions. It is still in local development, but this is just a snapshot of it. Um, here, you can see users of the dashboard could take a look at uh, a little bit more about the youth risk behavior survey here up at the top, more about the dashboard and the project and some other important considerations. They could also explore the data much in the same way we just did on the slides. They can make predictions using these drop downs. So you can see the questions here. How old is this individual choosing the correct age, choosing the gender assigned at birth, their race and ethnicity, their BMI, and a number of other features that were included in the model for prediction. And the classification results are listed at the bottom. So for this specific individual, the probability that they've had sex is 55.59%, that they've been sad or hopeless is close to 20%, and that they've tried smoking is around 12%. Then lastly, on the last tab, we can visualize the connections between these negative behaviors with this um, graph network that I created. And we can see the three nodes felt sad or hopeless, ever tried cigarettes and ever had sex. And I just highlighted the connections that had um, 10 or more percent response in common. So for example, of the students that reported feeling sad or hopeless for more than two weeks in a row, 15.6% of them also reported ever having sex. Um, for drinking alcohol, 17.3% of them also reported using marijuana. So it does give us a few, a little bit more information outside of just the three targets that we were looking at specifically. And now back to the presentation for some future work. In the future, I think there are a lot of applications for this dashboard, as I've mentioned. I'd like to add um, a feature that would find a metro area like mine. I mentioned that they give the survey in 35 different districts around the country. And I think that, you know, given different political leanings or um, different population size, things like this, we might be able to get a little bit better scores from the uh, indicators if we narrowed it down by geography. I'd like to consult with some experts in clinical settings for the utility of these predictions and even create specific dashboards for, um, for clinics based on their own survey data and their own geographic areas, and then tailor the inputs on the dashboard to different audiences. Thank you so much for joining. Um, all my information is listed here and I welcome any questions or comments about this project or any others um, on my site. Thank you so much.